Hey everyone, Ranger William here from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. What are we going to be doing with this series covered with flame and smoke is chopping this up and looking at the different weapons and tactics that were used by the Overmountain men, the Yadkin Valley Patriots, other Patriots who were involved on the Overmountain Victory Trail and the Battle of Kings Mountain, as well as the Loyalist Defenders, the local militia and the Loyalist Provincials under Patrick Ferguson. Now, the reason we're doing this is because of how important this battle and this story is to understanding the American Revolution. Any study of the American Revolution, especially in the South, is going to mention Kings Mountain. This battle fills a place in our nation's memory where you kind of had this haughty British officer who foolishly insulted the frontier mountain people, and he made a poor use of terrain, a worse use of tactics, and he ended up dead and buried under a rock on that battlefield as a lesson to all the other haughty British officers. Now, this kind of understanding of the story is a uh, kind of a, a little fantasized. It's very simplified um, and it's just shrouded in folk legend. Uh, the truth of the real events found in eyewitness accounts, battlefield archaeology, it's far more intriguing. It's far more exciting. And I believe it's more powerful for what this battle means to the story of our nation. So what did this battle really do? We're going to start out here in uh, episode one, a little bit of background about the story of the Battle of Kings Mountain. Um, and we're going to start out with this quote from British commander Sir Henry Clinton, the overall commander in chief of North American forces at the time of this battle. He says that this action uh, so encouraged the spirit of rebellion in the Carolinas that it could never afterward be humbled. And it was the first link in a chain of evils that resulted in the total loss of America. Now, to make sure we're looking at this evenly, that's your British overall commander. And then here's Virginia Governor Thomas Jefferson. He actually calls this battle the joyful enunciation of that turn of the tide of success. So how is this possible? How did you go from a British army just steamrolling across the southern colonies, and now you have this battle that seems to turn things around. How did a group of patriot, backcountry, partisan, guerrilla fighter, militia kind of guys, how did they defeat a superior force of trained loyalist militia led by one of the best British officers in the colonies? So examining the weapons technology, the tactics that were used, described by participants and um, other eyewitnesses to this part of the war, this will help us better see and understand how this battle occurred, and how this changed the course of the American Revolution. Now, looking at the story that leads to this battle, the Overmountain Victory Trail. Uh, this is a National Historic Trail created by the National Park Service for the centennial, I'm sorry, for the bicentennial of the, uh, the Battle of Kings Mountain in 1980, when that was commemorated. And there's a map of it that you see here beside me. Um, this is going to be this nice kind of Y-shaped brown squiggle that uh, has two different trailheads, one up in southwest Virginia at Abingdon, way up there, and then the other more to the east in Elkin, North Carolina, leading down through North Carolina through eastern Tennessee into South Carolina, where it leads to Kings Mountain National Military Park. Now, um, there's going to be various groups of Patriot, partisans, and militia gathering along the way. The last big one is going to be at Saunders Cowpen, now Cowpen's National Battlefield, on October 6th, 1780. Now, when these guys gather there, by the time they reach that point, uh, some of these militia, they've been in the saddle, they've been in pursuit of Patrick Ferguson for 12 days, uh, while some of them had only joined the pursuit that morning. So a variety of experiences you're going to have along this trail. And these guys are going to be coming from what is uh, now five or six states, uh, six if you count some guys that may have come from part of what is now Kentucky. But you have men coming from South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, what is now Tennessee, and maybe what is now Kentucky, all taking part in this pursuit. Um, now, they were never all in one place at one time. Um, this is just due to them being in these scattered groups coming together at different points. But also, we have these descriptions collected by Lyman Draper back in the 19th century. They talk about how strange stretched out their lines were. These men were described as riding sometimes single file or side by side. And look at these hundreds and hundreds of men making these kinds of lines. That can be quite the large group. 
Uh, but by, by the time they converge at that cattle pen, at Saunders cattle pen on the evening of October 6th, um, there's possibly 2,000, a little over 2,000 of these guys coming together in this field. Uh, but they've been in this saddle, like I mentioned, 12 days, beginning in late September. That's when our story really starts. Uh, Patrick Ferguson is going to send a proclamation, a message to these various Patriot partisans telling them to pretty much stop fighting. Um, there's a bit of back and forth over what the actual phrasing was used. Um, uh, he's kind of famously remembered for threatening them with fire and sword if they do not desist opposing British arms. I have not been able to find any documentation for that yet, um, but he definitely did say uh, that they would be outside of his protection if they kept fighting. Um, but the message is thread. Uh, the message is spread. Uh, Ferguson is identified as the major threat to these Western patriots, and they begin to gather. So for 12 days, these men travel from all across the Blue Ridge Mountains, coming together here on October 6th. Um, now, Patrick Ferguson, he is aware of these movements. We don't want to get this idea that Ferguson is entirely surprised at the Battle of Kings Mountain. Um, as of, I believe, September 19th, uh, Patrick Ferguson is already receiving intelligence that these men are gathering, that there is a plan to cross over the mountains and come into the theater of operations there in the Carolinas. And this information is going to be reinforced several times by numerous other scouts and spies, uh, kind of famously by two patriots who desert from the march and come and warn Ferguson, uh, Samuel Chambers and James Crawford. These are just two of the men that are coming into Ferguson's camp with this information. But Ferguson begins falling back towards Charlotte. He's a bit cautious. He's not wanting to make this mad dash back to the main British army in Charlotte, North Carolina, not wanting to exhaust his men before he can, um, before he uh, meets the enemy. Um, and also he's trying to intercept some uh, Patriot Georgians who have just been kind of chased out of Northeast Georgia Georgia, chased by British and Loyalist forces coming from Augusta with some reinforcements from 96. Um, and his orders, Ferguson's orders, are to intercept these Georgians and gain any intelligence intelligence he can about their and their movements. So he's not he's a little hesitant to just kind of make this mad dash. His whole purpose out here was to encourage the Loyalists, show them the British are winning the war. If he just tucks tail and runs away, that doesn't make for a very good appearance. So He's kind of retreating a little cautiously. He's writing to uh, writing to Lord Cornwallis, requesting reinforcements, um, talking about how strong his uh, camp is going to be when he makes it at King's Mountain. Um, one thing, kind of a famous account, he says that God Almighty and all the rebels in hell cannot move me from this rock. Again, boasting of how formidable the, his uh, encampment is going to be that he makes right here next to me on October 7th, 1780. Now, daylight on that day, October 7th, is going to find um, from these thousands of patriots that were at that cattle pasture, when they realized that Ferguson is only 35 miles down the road, and they thought moving quickly back towards Charlotte, they handpicked the 910 best marksmen on the freshest horses. These guys take off during the night of October 6th, through a rainstorm all the next morning of the 7th until they finally arrive at Patrick Ferguson's camp the afternoon of October 7th. Soaked with rain, exhausted, hungry. Some of these guys haven't eaten in about a day and a half, but they finally find themselves at the battlefield. Now, the the ridge where Patrick Ferguson makes his camp is kind of this, this footprint shape. Um, with the larger, the toe of it, it's going to be pointing towards the northeast, the narrow heel to the southwest. Now, it takes a few hours for the Patriots to gather their men together. Um, they have been traveling, again, all through the night, through that morning, um, looking at their numbers, again, thinking if they're described as riding single file or in kind of in small little groups, it could be almost a two-mile long trail of men and horses um, making their way to this ridge. So when they get here, it takes a while for them to gather together. Together, but the plan is made for this group to kind of form four different columns and swing around two left, two to the right, and surround Patrick Ferguson's camp, closing off any chance of escape. Now, one of Patrick Ferguson's surgeons, a doctor named Oozel Johnson, is going to record in his diary, his journal from the, uh, the war, that he heard a gunshot at the edge of camp. He checks his pocket watch. It says it was 3 o'clock p.m. So what is the weapon that Dr. Johnson is hearing? What is that 
uh, that first gunshot. And what weapons are these men going to be using? What is in the loyalist hands, the patriot hands? What weapons are about to clash here on this oblong little ridge? Now, all the firearms at this time are going to be flintlock. Um, what that means is that you have, uh, as in, the, in the yellow circle above me here, you have that black stone kind of uh, tapered down to a sharp edge. That is going to be flint, a uh, very solid stone. Pieces of it can be flaked off or napped so that it has a kind of a, a very sharp cutting edge. Um, this is what you're going to see uh, when you pull the trigger. It falls forward. And the L-shaped piece of metal in front of that flint, the hammer, that's going to be covering a little bit of gunpowder. So when you have that sharp flint strike at the proper angle against that steel face of the hammer, it's not only going to push it out of the way, exposing that gunpowder, but when it scrapes along the edge, it's going to cut into the metal, uh, scraping or cutting off small microscopic pieces of steel. Um, those come off as sparks, and those sparks fall on that exposed gunpowder, and that's how you have an ignition. So that top left picture up there with the, uh, the British soldier with the red coat and the black and white hat has that little explosion in front of his face there. That is the priming charge. That is that small bit of gunpowder there next to the flint igniting from that spark. And if you look really close on the side of this, uh, the rifle here above me, you see there's a small hole in the side of the barrel leading into the bore, into the barrel itself, that main chamber where the main gunpowder charge has been packed down from the muzzle. When that little flash or that explosion travels through that hole, it's going to ignite that main gunpowder charge and the weapon's going to fire. So I'm trying to scoot over here. You can see this picture behind me of uh, this cloud of grayish white gun smoke. This is going to be quite a long time before the invention of smokeless gunpowder. So when this weapon is fired, you're going to have this huge cloud of gray and white smoke. Um, now, gunpowder, it's, it's attempted to be made in a uniform measurement. That way you know what you can rely on. Um, it's going to all work the same way. The ingredients are sulfur, charcoal, and potassium nitrate mixed in proper levels of 10%, 15%, and 75%. But if you get that off a little bit, um, you're going to uh, run into different combustion rates. Um, if you get it off too much, you're not going to have very good gunpowder. Um, and the smoke, again, coming from these weapons, it's going to uh, cover battlefields. Um, so when you have all these ingredients mixed together properly and it ignites, um, again, this is this huge cloud of thick smoke. Uh, one of the Patriot leaders here at the battle, Isaac Shelby, is going to recall later on that, quote, the mountain was covered with flame and smoke and seemed to thunder, end quote. So that's actually where we get the title for our program, Covered with Flame and Smoke. Now, this is not only going to um, block the soldiers' view after a while, make it hard for officers to see. That's one reason for the bright uniforms to be able to tell troops in combat. But it's going to leave residue on the weapon, affecting the weapon's performance. So you're going to see this residue build up. Um, talking about that flint and that piece of steel. If there's that gunpowder uh, residue coating that steel, then that flint is not having a, a, a clean strike. And it's not going to make the proper sparks. Now. Um, the British are going to be um, issuing gunpowder out to these men. One of the uh, orders that Patrick Ferguson had from Sir Henry Clinton is to issue ammunition to his men from British stores. Of course, you will have any kind of guys who can be bringing their powder horns, their gunpowder from home that they've maybe uh, squirreled away somewhere. Um, and the Patriots especially talk about their lack of gunpowder. Uh, when Benjamin Cleveland is leading his guys down the Yadkin Valley to join the Overmountain men and join this pursuit, he writes to Continental Army General Horatio Gates, noting how, how poor they are with gunpowder, requesting any supplies possible to be sent out to them. Now, a notable part of our story with the Overmountain men is Mary Patton. Now, Mary Patton lived in what is now East Tennessee, and she was known as a powder smith. She made gunpowder. And before the Overmountain men gathered and uh, began the pursuit of Patrick Ferguson, Mary Patton actually donates to them 500 pounds of her homemade high quality gunpowder for them to use during this fight. Now, we don't want to kind of undermine Mary's role here. This is an amazing feat, especially taken on by one person. But when, it, when you look at these numbers, they talk about they're low on gunpowder, they don't have enough. Mary gives 500 pounds, but a thousand men left Sycamore Shoals. 
a thousand over mountain men crossed over. So that's a, you know, if they are relying on Mary's powder, that kind of boils down to only about a half pound of gunpowder per person. That's not even a full powder horn. So when these uh, these uh, over mountain patriots, especially, but when these patriots go into the battle at Kings Mountain, when they begin shooting, when they've trapped Patrick Ferguson, they really only have enough ammunition for one big fight, for one big battle. So if this does not go well for them, if they lose this fight, if they are pursued or attacked by another British force, they may not have the ammunition necessary to go into another fight. So it's a big thing for them. They are playing all their hand. They are all in here at 3 o'clock p.m. on October 7th, 1780 at Kings Mountain. Now let's talk about the, uh, the projectiles. Um, the two weapons that they're going to be using here in this battle are some of the most iconic of the period, and especially of the American Revolution, the flintlock rifle or the long rifle, the Pennsylvania rifle, and the smoothbore musket. Now, from Kings Mountain National Military Park, 139 artifacts have been recovered, um, including 81 fired and 54 unfired round lead balls, the projectiles. But Ranger Will, how can you tell if they've been fired or not? Glad you asked. Um, if you notice here on uh, the, the picture behind me, you have three rows of these round lead balls, uh, it's a couple of different sizes. But notice how that middle row, those three in the middle, they're not perfectly round. They're kind of misshapen. Some of them are a little oblong. Some of them have some kind of corners or jagged looking edges. Lead is a fairly soft metal. So when this lead strikes against something more solid, such as a stone, piece of iron or steel, or even human bone, that round lead ball is not going to keep its shape. It's going to deform. This actually is one of the main reasons why a musket, uh, a musket ball wound is so crucial. Um, that ball by kind of smushing against that solid object in this situation a human bone that would kind of transfer all that energy that kinetic energy traveling with that ball would be transferred into that bone causing it to kind of to shudder or to shiver um, where you get multiple fractures and small breaks happening from all that energy being so completely transferred from that softer lead um, but anyway this could also happen if you hit a piece of metal or a rock, like I mentioned. Um, but looking at the shape here, uh, there's no difference. Um, the only difference is the size. This is all lead. Um, another way we can tell if they've been fired is if they are deteriorating from being exposed to gunpowder. That residue I mentioned from that gun smoke is going to actually eat away at metal after a period. So if these things have been in the ground for a couple hundred years, um, of course, there's many factors that play on them when they're underground, but that gunpowder residue can also have an effect. And a chemical analysis can reveal if there's gunpowder residue on that ball. Now, we are going to talk about these a little more um, in, our, in our next episode about the idea of muskets versus rifles, but I'll just kind of touch base on it here quickly. Um, one of the big kind of myths about this battle is that Patrick Ferguson and his loyalists had his entire force on top of that ridge, roughly about 1,100 men, only using flintlock muskets, only using linear combat smoothbore muskets, while all of the Patriots were all using uh, uh, hunting rifles, long rifles, and unconventional kind of guerrilla tactics in the woods. Uh, we're going to talk about that in our next episode. Is that really true? Was it that clean cut of musket versus rifle, straight lines, versus taking to trees. Um, that'll be our next episode. But I hope you enjoyed listening a, a little bit, uh, talking about these, um, the, the weapons, the flintlocks, gunpowder, um, and a little bit of the backstory behind the Battle of Kings Mountain. So again, this was episode one of Covered with Flame and Smoke, looking at the weapons and tactics of the Battle of Kings Mountain. Join us for episode two, really diving in to the muskets and the rifles. Their differences, some of their similarities, and who was using them at the Battle of Kings Mountain. So I hope you enjoyed, and thanks for watching.